Hello everybody, Captain Sidaris here. After following the development of 7 Days to Die for a very long time, I'm finally joining the party. To skip a little bit the noob phase, I decided to invite a fellow YouTuber and veteran of the game to share a little bit of the secrets and I'm of course especially interested in what keeps a player in game. So I say hello to 2.5. Hi there. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, really good, thanks. Thanks for having me. How are you? Not bad. Vienna is finally cooling down, summer is closing, and I'm happy. I don't like hot weather. Yeah, I'm the same as you. I'm the same. And yeah, going, for, of course, from the classic topic, the weather, to the <laughs> gaming topic. How did you get into the game? How did I get into this game? Um, well, through um, Neebs Gaming. Have you heard of Neebs Gaming? Absolutely not. So Neebs Gaming is a really big gaming channel, actually. Um, they've It's a group of, I think, four or five friends, and they record things like Ark, like Seven Days to Die. They've done Minecraft in the past. And it's kind of very much chaotic, you know, um, comedy-based gameplay. I just found one of their compilations of them playing GTA one day, and I was very much I used to be a GTA player, you know? I wasn't, um, I wasn't a Seven Days player at all. And through their channel, I really found them funny. I really liked the content. And then I was like, oh, I want to see more of their stuff. So I clicked on their Seven Days to Die playlist, and that's how I discovered it. And my mind was kind of blown. It's really changed gaming for me, this game, because it's just such an open world sandbox experience. You can do what you want. There's no narrative to follow. You don't have to do a certain thing a certain way. So, yeah, this has just uh, been my obsession since 2017. <laughs> oh, yeah. Quite a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. What keeps you basically in game for so long? I think, well... You know, what I've said about it being an open-ended sandbox experience, you can kind of do what you want uh, with it, but also the frequent updates. So with it being an alpha, you know, if you've been following the development yourself, you'll be aware um, it's been, you know, alpha 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, it went right through to alpha 21 before it hit 1.0. And each one of those updates was like a new game sometimes. It was, they overhauled so much. They improved the graphics. They changed the zombies. They changed POIs, quests, it's completely different to how it was, you know, when I first got into it. So that keeps you engaged because it's so different. And then, and then you've got the modern community, of course, who, like any game, the modern community is huge just to kind of keep players engaged, I think, and, you know, bring, you know, new ideas and context um, and concepts that maybe the main devs don't. So, yeah, it, that's, it's been very easy to stay invested with it because every 12 months or so, it's just been like a brand new game. Talking about the modding community, I'm... I love everything modding wise. So I'm curious how extensive is it in this game? It was a strange one. There's nothing on the Steam Workshop. You'll probably have noticed that straight away because the game doesn't have workshop support yet. It is on their roadmap. They do want to do that. But there is ways that you can mod the game. Uh, you can you can do it through overhaul mods. There's a mod launcher that you can download, which is like a third party thing. Or you can just, you know, if you know how to do it, you can go into the folders and change things about um, but there's there's a lot a lot of great mods out there, really talented modding community, you know, complete overhauls to the game. Uh, big ones would be things like Darkness Falls, that's probably the biggest one, uh, which it brings demons into the game. It brings, you know, complete overhaul to the way farming works, for example. It's um it's a really, you know, it, it really kind of brings back a lot of the features they removed from previous alphas that players missed. So the modder Kane for that one, he's uh he's done a great job with that. And that's uh, that's one that, you know, we always could, every player tends to kind of go to Darkness Falls after they've had their vanilla run as their first modded playthrough. That's quite nice, especially like that it's not a Steam Workshop, that it's basically a website. Yeah. I, I really enjoy archiving stuff and having it on a workshop on a specific platform you can't control is never a good decision. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, uh, it's kind of old school, isn't it? Yeah, totally, totally. And basically, what would you say about the community? How active is it? How friendly is it? Is it s similar to the DayZ community that basically you kill each other as soon as you see each other? <laughs> what is it? Well, it's not really um, a, much of a PvP or server game. There are servers out there and there are players that enjoy to play that, but it's, it's mainly a single player game. And if you're playing on a server with friends it will usually be with a select few friends and it's very much you've got a community where you're against the environment together 
So it tends to be more, more small pockets of communities, but I've got nothing but you know good things to say about the people who comment on my videos and that I've interacted with. It's been largely positive. I was a bit scared starting YouTube, thinking, oh, you know, am I just going to get trolled all the time and hear nightmare things about comment sections? But I've had you know very very much largely positive experience with the comments and the community. And talking a little bit also about platforms, is it? more or less everything on discord reddit where can i find basically the community hub um reddit's really really kind of thriving these days um i get a lot of people saying that they've seen something on reddit I, you know i'm old i don't have anything to do with reddit i don't know the first thing about using it but i hear people saying like oh yeah somebody posted something of, of yours on reddit so this is how i found you um so there is quite a good big reddit scene with memes and stuff like that um i'd say the seven days to die forums is quite a big one uh, there's a you know quite an active user base on the actual forums that the devs run themselves, which is quite nice. And uh, beyond that, yeah, uh, it's probably they're probably probably the main ones. Um, and then YouTube, of course, where people kind of, I think that's where a lot of people kind of congregate as well, because there's there's a lot of big big YouTubers out there, people like Glock Nine, Capo, uh, you know, so Guns Nerds and Steel. These are big big YouTubers, and I think a lot of people you know have. Um, their Discord servers and so on with that they tend to hang out on as well. It's really a relief to hear that. So many games nowadays sadly only have Discord as a community hub and it's a gated community. Yeah. If you don't have the invite code, yeah, you're screwed. Should we take out the zombie over here? Let's bring her over. Perfect. I'll let you take a care of her. Nice. Say, uh, say good night. I wanted to say, <laughs> but you don't want to say good night. Nicely done. So, okay, let's continue. Yeah. Uh, before we go, basically to the next question, I would like to see your base on this server. Can you show me? Yeah, absolutely. So we're just outside of here in this lovely part of town. As you can see, I've got a nice bar down the road there, a motel, and a lovely rundown diner across the street. There's this car that's uh, just been here since day one, which is amazing. It hasn't been blown up by zombies yet. And then this is an old silo that was completely ruined. And I decided, well, the first seven days I spent living in front of the trader on the side of the road. But then I decided to move on top of this. And then I built a horde base kind of attached to it. So what you're looking at there is the horde base element. And then my goods and stuff are, you know, out the back there. Um, so the horde base actually has a big pit. So if we come down these stairs here, you can see there's um, three or four steel on the ground here. And up there, you can see those kind of thin walkways. That's where zombies kind of fall between the cracks and they land down here. The idea of the ladders, um, the stairs are just to give them a way back up so they can keep looping. Otherwise, they would just, you know, probably undermine the whole base if they were stuck down here. Um, so if we run back up. Uh, we can show you how the zombies would path if you'd like. So they can. So the ladders are for the zombies. These stairs here are for the dogs and direwolves because they can't use ladders. Uh, it's just to stop them congregating at the bottom. But if we run up the ladder, be careful at the top. Because this is where the zombies would run down. And then they would try to get to me here. I'm standing behind there. And then they, you know, if I move left to right. Because of the way these are, they think there's a full block, essentially, and they think they can step across. They drop down to the bottom there. Um, it'd be nice if we can get a zombie to show up, uh, maybe, and I could show you in action in a minute. But uh, and then the ladders are a bit chunky. Yeah, at the moment, they are not... They're a little bit shy. Yeah, <laughs> they are. But it's day 36, day 35 would have been a horde night. So we would have had some... Yeah, the ladders are a bit, a bit strange in this game these days. But um, over here, if you're interested at all in mining... Uh, Here's my motorcycle and here's my mine entrance. And that's just, you know, as you might expect, it's just a long tunnel of me where I've been mining. <laughs> so this is what I tend to do overnight to gather stone, iron, lead, nitrate, coal. And that's what's great about this game is you can, you know, destroy every single block except for the one we're stood on right now because that's bedrock. But, but every, everything from bedrock and up is destructible, which is beautiful. It's just um, the, the freedom it gives you. It's just un unbelievable. So... I've never known anything like it where you can mold the game to your liking, look at it and say, I did that. You know, it's uh, it really is like your own kind of little world in a way. Yeah, big sandbox, basically. Yeah, exactly. 
And I actually missed Minecraft. I never, ever played Minecraft. I, that passed me by completely. And so this is my... You know, most players go from Minecraft to this. This is like the next step up from Minecraft in a way. Um, but I missed Minecraft completely and just this was my first ever thing. So uh, we run around here. I show you my living quarters. The ladder might be a bit tricky to jump on, but there we go. Um, so as I said before, this is where I fight the zombies. Uh, you'll note there's spikes on the roof because that's for vultures to fly into just so I don't have to shoot them. And this is uh, the bit where you just stood on, where the zombies get yeeted off. We come back here, this is you know, workbenches, forges, storage, all labelled. That's an infinite water source that you can drink stri straight from. There's a mod that you can install in a helmet, which means you can just drink infinity, basically. Um, if you drink it without that mod, it will damage you. Uh, we've got our dew collector over here, collecting water for us, chemistry station, cement mixer. And then finally, the most recent addition, as you can see I'm still building this, this is all unupgraded, um, is the farm over here. And so this is all my produce that I've planted. And that's the base, really. As you can see, that's um, the back there with the kind of rusty pillars. That's what the whole thing looked like initially. I so love player bases in any game. I'm basically coming from the classic MMO that was Galaxies, where you also could create your own bases, could go as crazy as you want, basically. Yeah. And having something that creative with the concept of Minecraft behind it, really nice. Yeah. Like, so much more. Oh, agreed. And there's some, you know, I'm not a very talented builder aesthetically, but there's some people out there that can make incredible things. If I just throw you a couple of frames here, if you pick them up. Yeah. If you hold a frame and, you know, get it in your hotbar so it's in your hand. If you hold R, the R key, and go up to the radial menu and select shape, this menu's got over 2,000 shapes that you can choose to build from. Shape, yeah. A second. Yeah. And oh, then yeah. you can, it, it might be filtered to basic, you can unfilter basic, and then it's just, there's literally 2,159 shapes in that menu. Unbelievable. So you can imagine the things talented builders can come up with in this game. It's crazy. I guess you could say this game is a big time sink. Yes. <laughs> so... What, what would you say, how much time did you invest in this space? Um, well, it's day 36, so it's one hour days, but for some reason the days are actually one hour, 10 minutes in this game when it says one hour. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just uh, it's gradual over the playthrough. I tend to, I mean, for me, what I generally do is I go out looting and questing for most of the day. So that's the trader over there. You can't see it too well right now, but that flag over there... Um, that's actually Thick44 Flag, who was uh, a member of Neeb's Game In. Uh, so I'd like to tribute to him, which is really nice. Um, and then there's the Trader Compound over there, which is where you go to buy, sell, you do quests for them. So that's what I do most of the time. And then overnight, I mine, as you saw, to gather resources. And then I'll build, you know, something like this. So this probably didn't take too long. It, the, the resources were the main thing, gathering that. Um, but yeah, this probably four hours worth of work, maybe. The actual building, but a lot more than that when, it, when you factor in gathering resources. Yeah, of course, the collecting art in the, those types of games are <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Did you basically already told your typical day in this game? Maybe skip to the next question. What would you say are your favorite weapons, vehicles, locations, in-game features, stuff like that? Okay, well, let me, um, since we are in an old save that I'm not using anymore, I can, without guilt, turn off AI and spawn in something to do a bit of a demonstration for you here. So, if I bring in a feral biker to stand there, if we come around and look at this guy. He's, the AI's off, so he can't hurt you. So, which one have I got my repulsor on? Uh, this one. So, watch this guy go flying now when I hit him. So, I'll charge him. Now, watch this. Ooh. So, <laughs> this is a stunt Tom. I've given you one of them, actually, the Stumper Tom. Yeah. But if I just drop this one on the ground for you, you can more than welcome to have a go. You see it there? It, it should be the same weapon as I have here. But I've, um, this one I've just given you's uh, got the Stun Repulsor mod on it, which is the thing that makes them go flying. Oh, okay. So, um, you might just need to hit him once with a power attack to charge it up. 
Oh, power judge. Sorry. No, doesn't work for some reason. Uh, just, just, uh, it's probably because you're not poked in, but if you just hit him a few times, it'll charge up eventually. Just drop down. Is there four damage? Yes. <laughs> there he goes. And so that's the stun baton. That's probably my favorite melee weapon right now. I can see why. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Once you're all perked in. And then you've got things like the sledgehammer. So I'll pull one of those out of creative here. So as you can see, it's a bit of a beast. Again, just really heavy hitting. This is a feral biker, so it's a particularly tough zombie. But, you know, if you press the N, the November key, um, you can see here there's different skills and stuff that you can uh, perk into. So under strength, for example, if you were to pick Skull Crusher and perk into that all the way, this would be, become a lot more devastating. With that one that you hold in there, the Stumper Tom, the Intellect Tree and the Electrocutioner perk is what I've perked into there. And that's made that a lot more effective for me. So yeah, melee. I'm a very melee heavy player. I really like that you can basically not only customize the game as you want, but also spawn in enemies or zombies in that sense and have them passive test basically stuff. It's really nice. Yeah, you can do, you, can, you know, you can, there's all sorts you can, you can do it uh, with kind of the admin controls. It's uh, yeah, it's, it lends itself really well to like, you know, cinematic gameplay and stuff. There's some channels out there that do really good. You know, they have like um, a second uh, view. That's the camera that flies around and stuff and gets really cinematic shots of them. Uh, Guns, Nerds and Steel, uh, who I mentioned earlier, he's a great example of that really cinematic, really top quality, um, you know, content on YouTube. So I'd recommend, you know, just perhaps just having a glance at his content. It's really, really good stuff. Uh, what's the other thing? Oh yeah, so let's... Um, Let's pull in here. So this is another thing that uh, I don't know if you knew was in the game. <laughs> Hyrocopter. Roughly how many vehicles are in game? I'll show them. I'll, I'll get them all out for you as a showcase. So, uh, so four by four. That one. We've got mini. We've got this one and we got this one i'll get them all out now so we have motorcycle we have the mini bike we have the bicycle and we have eventually once it finds a spot the four by four so they're all the vehicles that you can use currently there's modded vehicle packs that have you know a much more expansive list than this but this is the vanilla base game and can i find those vehicles in in a typical session so lying on the map basically or do i have to buy them you well you can craft them you can craft them you can buy the parts or you can craft them you can occasionally loot the parts um a bit later game but usually it's a case of uh, yeah, you, you kind of craft them. So if you go, it's, it's a skill thing again. So there's um, a skill perk called Grease Monkey under the intellect tree. Perk into that, you're more likely to get things that are to do with this and the crafting recipes get cheaper and stuff. So, And it's all gated behind the vehicle adventure crafting magazines. I see. So a lot of progression. Yeah. That's one thing um, that's changed over the years. I mean, we'll, we'll probably come to it later, but it's... Uh, yeah, the progression system's changed a lot over the years. I like that. I really do. Maybe a little bit more variety on the vehicle side would be nice, especially since the game is out for so many years. But if you have a modding community, it's fine. I agree. Hop in. Uh, no, I can't. You have to unlock it. <laughs> Good point. I'm just too shy. See if I can remember how to fly this. How easy is flying? In armor, it's <laughs> hard, but here? So it's space bar to go up, um, it's C to pitch it down, and it's just, you know, shift and W to kind of go forward. So, I mean, you can more than welcome to have a go if you want. No, no, no. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, since we're in the air, maybe. Show me on this map your favorite location. Uh, sure. 
So I don't know how quickly we'll get to it, but I'll tell you what we can. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to maybe the desert biome. Desert biome's a nice looking biome. And I'll see if there's any nice POIs that I like over there. But it'll take us a little, a bit, little bit to get there. So yeah, if you've got any other questions while we're going, we can admire the view. Oh, so many, so many. Um, the, the first one, which is totally now on my mind, would be DC is also known as the walking simulator. Is this here also the case, or do you really have quickly a, a bike or a nice helicopter like this one? So this is an endgame item, so the gyrocopter, you're probably... I don't know, you could probably... It depends on how much of a min-maxer you are with anything, so... I'm a bit of a min-maxer, so... If I want something, I know how to game the system to get it quite quickly. Um, and... They they have slowed it down, this version. It's, uh, it's not as fast as it used to be. But... If you put your points in a certain way, that'll influence the magazine drops you get and what you can unlock at what stage. And, you know, you could probably get the gyrocopter by day... 28 maybe the bicycle is actually guaranteed um quest reward for completing tier one quests which you could probably get done by day three not bad the bicycle tends to be you know, at least one that you can get quite early yeah comparing to daisy it's very fast yeah that's really good it's it's one th one of the things it's um it's progressed it's kind of gone a little bit, yeah, a little bit more uh, kind of arcade shooter mode, um, some people say. Some people like it, some people don't. This is awful weather, isn't it? Can't see a thing. But I like I thought the... I'd bring you to the nice sunny desert, my own. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the dynamic weather system. It's always good to have. Does it also influence the zombies in the sense that they can see you in this weather, or at least... The weather doesn't, but nighttime does, so they, they struggle to see you more at nighttime. Okay. I thought they had a night vision included, but good to know. This is downtown over here, so this is um this is probably one of the. Well, look at this. This is a nice building over here. Look at that beautiful church or oh, the church, cathedral yeah. or whatever it is. It's big. It's a nice yeah. looking building. Let's see if we can let's see if I can land this, shall we? And I guess you can basically, with exception of the traders. Um, fortify every building, make a base there. Absolutely, yeah. So that's what some people like to do. Uh, so they like to, uh, you know, just take over something like this, maybe. And this is a perfect example, actually. So because this is a remnant, so that means it's not a questable POI. It's going to have limited zombies in. And this is the type of build project somebody might like to take over. Um, renovate, rebuild, and turn into the place they live. What I find really interesting is that they didn't include these types of vehicles as playable, drivable vehicles, because you see them so often in the game. Yeah, well, there's, there was a mod called Undead Legacy, which was out in Alpha 20, which honestly is probably the best version of the game I've ever played. It's so good. Um, and that actually would allow you to you know, once you progress to a certain point, you could craft a vehicle repair kit and you could repair any vehicle on the map to make it a drivable vehicle. Um, so, yeah, the vehicles like this in that mod, they were drivable. Uh, that mod was so good. I hope they brings it back soon. Yeah, I guess like in so many other games, every new version breaks the mods, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So the poor modders have to go through it every single time. But yeah, this is probably what I'd consider my favorite location, just because of the fun and chaos you can have down here. This is downtown, so rather than one POI, it's just a collection of POIs. And it's like, you know, these are all questable places. You've got, this is Party Girl right here. Um, she's feral as well, you can tell by the glowing yellow eyes. Um, so <laughs> she'll uh, she'll mess you up because she's got that um, the extra kind of strength and speed. Uh, but she's currently got the AI off, so she can't hurt us right now. And this is a little crawler down here, look. <laughs> yeah, I met him many, many times in my three, four hours <laughs> in-game already. Yeah, I think they've done a great job. The, the, the POIs, are, you know, like this town hall here with the flag and everything. 
it's things like this. It's, this is where it's come so far, I think. The POI and level design is just a really, really talented team that are doing that. It's, this is a, you know, what sets it apart, really, I think, from something like Minecraft, for example. It's um, the world feels more like it's gone through an apocalypse almost, or it's just yeah, the, the level design is just really, and they tell a story as well. You know, it's like you go through it and you can see little stories being told, little narratives as you go through it. Like, oh, this is where they barricaded it. And there's a zomb this is a there's zombies in the closet here, and this is obviously where they were holding themselves up before the outbreak happened and stuff. So, yeah, level design is one of the absolute best things about this game these days. That's definitely one of the reasons why I waited a little bit longer to finally play this game. I hear it for so many years now that there will be a story at some point in the game, and I thought, hey, maybe 1.0, but no, sadly not. Oh, no, um, they. I think that's on the roadmap for the next eighteen months or so. But yeah, it's one of. The, I would. I hope it's an optional thing because I'm not one for stories myself. I don't particularly like story-based games. I much prefer an open world where I can kind of make my own decisions. But if the story is optional, I would like the option to do it. I think it's a. It could only be a positive thing. Exactly. I. I don't need it in my sandbox game that badly, but having as as an additional flavor. Where I can do this together as a group, that's nice. Yeah, agreed. But I guess you already can do so many things in game. Maybe you can tell me one of your favorite activities in game. Um, well, one of my favorite activities would be um, this, really. So what we're doing now, just going to, like, say, for example, this here. This is um, a quest POI. I mean, let's let's turn the zombies on, shall we, and have some fun. So. Okay. Uh, I'll just quickly take it through a bit of it. We won't do it for long, but as you can see, we've got running zombies here straight off the bat. We've got... There you go. He's stunned. So you can have you can have at him while I've still him. There we go. So yeah, just coming through and then like everywhere will be, we'll have some sort of logical flow to it. You've got loot and stuff, which is always a nice dopamine hit. Um, got a zombie trying to break in from outside, which is always fun here. How bad is the loot god in this game? And by that I mean, does the loot god, the looting system basically know what you currently really, really need and doesn't give you? Well, it's actually influenced. So those perks we were looking at earlier, so we talked about the stun baton perks, um, that will, they'll drop more stun baton based perks, uh, loot if you perk into it. So it's actually, it, it favors you that way. But it's all tied behind something called loot stage. If I can find it. Um, yeah, so if you press tab and click on the little uh, skills icon, which is the guy with the graduation hat on. Uh, not yep. not skills, mm -hmm. sorry, character. Mm -hmm. My mistake, character. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can see you've got your character there. And then if you click over one tab to the core character stats, it's like, it looks like an internet connection logo. Yeah. Yeah. And then right at the bottom, it says loot stage. I see it, yeah. What does it mean? Yep, so that number denotes what type of loot you get, basically. So... That's one thing, you know, I'd like I'd like there to always be a chance to get top tier loot, no matter what, even if it's a really small 1% chance. But loot stage basically makes it so you are always going to get a certain type of loot at a certain stage. Now, the interesting thing about it is we, you saw we were in the forest earlier, we're in the desert now. Um, the loot stage enhances by which biome you're in. So at the top, you can see a little yellow uh, skull next to the red ones. The yellow skull denotes the difficulty of the biome and therefore the loot stage increase. So the loot's kind of what you make of it. Uh, where can I see that? Um, so if you... Let's step back outside. And it's going to be easier to show you there. Uh, let's turn the zombies back off as well. There we go. So can you see at the top right, it says desert with one skull. Uh, I'm stupid. Where? On your, oh, yeah, uh, so on your screen. Yeah, yeah, one skull. So in the forest, it'll just say forest. It won't have any. In the burnt forest, it'll have half a skull. Desert has one skull. I think snow has one and a half. And wasteland has two skulls, which is the hardest one. And But also, with them being harder, it's going to have tougher enemies, but also the loot's going to be better. So it's kind of a risk-reward thing. I totally see, yeah. A nice system. Really different. Yeah, it's nice. It's, it's a bit linear, maybe, but it's nice, yeah. And talking about loot... One complaint I always have in DayZ is that you're going, for example, in a cement factory and you find everything except of cement. 
<laughs> is this here also? Is it? Is the loot basically emphasized to give you, or the loot table emphasized to give you the stuff you find in this, in this type of building? My answer is kind of. So if I we, we jump back in here, this is popping pills, right? So you might come in here wanting a bandage or something. You might go, oh, I need medical supplies. So if I can find a lootable container, um, there's so a shelf. Jump back here. So that shelf won't have Maybe. it. That'll have <laughs> junk in it. Um, but this shelf here. Uh, are you still at the counter? Behind the counter? Yeah. Uh, behind the counter, yeah. So this shelf here should have something medical related. Yeah, perfect. That's something I really missed in Daisy and the different mods. Yeah, so it depends on the... It basically, there's certain loot containers that will appear in certain POIs, is the answer. But it's not perfect. It's totally fine if it's random, but it should go into the right direction. Yeah. I don't want to find in a tank factory, for example, uh, scrap, yeah, scrap metal is fine, but t-shirts. I don't need t-shirts there. I, I get you completely, yeah. It's, uh, it's nice when loot's logical. I mean... The um the other game I love is Project Zomboid. Have you ever played that? I'm aware of it, but never played it. So it's uh yeah, that's the other game that I kind of really like. But the loot in that is really logical. So there's like a baseball bat factory in it, and it's full of baseball bats. No. There's um things like that, and even the zombies will be, um you know like tuned to the location. So if you go to the um, there's a boxing arena. If you go there, there's boxes in there, like uh, zombies and boxing gloves and stuff. So. Yeah, that game's got that game kind of gets it really right, I think, with loot and kind of you know immersion. But this game, it's it's kind of part of the way there. But then there's sometimes where the loot just doesn't make sense. But it's to be expected, I think. Uh, if there is a balance, I'm happy. That's totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, talking about happiness, what would you say after playing so many years? How happy are you with the current the current release of 1.0? Um. Yeah, no, I'm, I, th I think the game's better than it's ever been. So I'll go right out there and say this is the best version of it. There's some things that I wish they hadn't changed. So um, let me just quickly... Yeah, if I just give you this for a second here, uh, just for your video's sake, for the helmet light mod. If you modify that, um, you should be able to... Do you know how to modify armor? Uh, not now, but I will in a second, I hope. I just opened the modifier. Oh. Yeah, click uh, modify. And then um, you should be able to shift click that mod in there. Just a flashlight, I guess. Yeah, and then, um, so yeah, and then when you wear it and press F, you should be able to kind of see a bit better. How oh. to wear it, yeah. Have it. Ooh. Nice. Is that, is that working? Perfect. Cool. <laughs> um, Sorry, what were you asking me? I got completely distracted. Basically, we talked about how happy you were with the release. Yeah, so um, there's many, many things I really like about it. But one thing I wish they hadn't changed was the learn by doing system. So you were talking about vehicles earlier. Uh, if I drop these in the floor for you, these are vehicle adventure magazines. So in order to be able to learn how to craft magazines, um, I'm sorry, if you, in order to be able to learn how to craft vehicles you have to kind of read a certain amount of magazines and that just feels a bit strange to me whereas previously they would have it where the more stone axes you made the better at tool crafting you got the more you used a club the better at clubs you got and that was a really kind of rewarding system it wasn't perfect but they could have tuned it um so i much prefer that than kind of just clicking and spending a skill point clicking and reading the magazine so that's one thing i wish they'd kept the same but overall this game is far, far better than it's ever been. And looking back at the development process, was it a good communication between the team and the community or was it, yeah, clunky? Um, they've got better, is what I'd say. So in the past, they would they would over-promise and under-deliver, uh, which I think they've learned from because they, they stopped doing that now. Uh, but there was, you know, lots of times where they'd say, Oh, you can expect Alpha 17 in June, and then it'd be like six months later when it was actually out because of unforeseen difficulties, which always happens with game development. It's fine, but it's the whole thing of promising it, then people getting annoyed, and 
upset and then you know so there, there, there used to be issues with that but they have got a lot better at it in recent years that's good to hear but i hear it there was at least in the past something which annoyed you what would you say is the most annoying thing in this game in the past and maybe still is the crafter magazine thing i talked about that's probably one another thing that um annoys that annoys me in this version is the way zombies spawn behind you now so for example if we're going through this poi we're running through we clear this room um, and then we go to the next room and then we walk through something that triggers something and zombies spawn in this room behind us we've already been through here it doesn't make any logical sense that there would be zombies in a room you've already cleared that are coming behind you it's che it feels cheap it feels gamey and also it's the sort of thing you only fall for once so the next time i would know all right i need to run in there and run back out and then take them on out here again and and so it just all it does is encourage cheesy gameplay so that's something i don't like and um, that's something that annoys me but you know you adapt and you deal with it that's true i also had the feeling in my few hours in game that the zombies spawned a little bit out of nowhere yeah definitely it does happen and yeah being on that subject what would you like in the future that the developers change or should include so I would love it if they brought back learn by bit uh, learn by doing. I would love that. So that would be the progress, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I, that would be my main thing. Progress learning. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Maybe a combination of both. You know, there's a happy medium there to strike. Maybe some things you can do through action skills, and other things you have to perk into. You can you can you know have a hybrid system, but I think it's just missing in the game. Whereas, um, you know, a lot of games like Valheim, like Project Zomboid, these games all have learn by doing, and it's something that. It, there's just something about learn by doing that just feels really rewarding to the player, I think. Whereas pointing and clicking on a skill point, it doesn't have the same... I don't know, it just, there's just something about it that feels artificial rather than organic. Yeah, definitely. I also always loved in the past games where you had a lot of research in the background also, where you really had... Yeah, nowadays to Google basically back then to, to look up the forums basically to find certain kind of... Uh, play styles, workarounds, how the world basically is working. An additional flavor. Yeah, no, exactly. Moving on to your personal history, what would you say are your favorite memories in game? Have you, uh, for example, a special group highlight or did you play all the time alone? No, but you, uh, I've played with um, yeah, friends in the past and stuff and, you know, multiplayer you do create great memories doing that. I mean, when I first got, got into the game, the best memories are always when you've got the fear and you're scared of the game and you don't know it. Um, so, you know, the first night you're cowering on top of a roof, scared of every noise you hear, uh, absolutely petrified of the zombies. Um, you know, as soon as you learn everything about the game, a bit of the magic goes away. So definitely my best memories of this game were playing it. I used to play it on console on uh, PS4. There used to be a version on there. And I'd play it with my friend, and we'd be up. We'd play it twelve hours at a time sometimes, and we'd just you know be up until three in the morning, just long sessions, um, just you know being absolutely petrified, but loving it, just discovering all the things about building, and um, you know, just like doing things, just building and mining for hours and end, and exploring, and it was just yeah, uh, those early early days. I think they're always the most magical, aren't they? When you're just learning a game for the first time and you're really falling in love with it, I think they they're always the most precious memories. Couldn't agree more, especially the exploration of the world is such a huge part in gaming for me. So important. Definitely. And this game as well has random generation, of course. So randomly generated worlds. So not you you don't you're not always playing the same few maps. It's um and that's something that not many games have these days, is randomly generated worlds. So the fact that this has it and you can make every playthrough a bit different, it's re it's really nice. It's uh it's on the one side, of course, a good thing, but it can get really ugly if the developers, uh, yeah, mess up the how to call it the generation, the, the procedural generation of the the world. Basically, not sure how it's here. I, it sounds like it's very good. They worked really hard on it. Um, so they, I mean, the criticism these days is every map is almost too similar. So it's you know it's there's not that much variety, but you can do things with it, you know, that make it different. And there's mods and stuff, of course, as there always is. But 
yeah, they've really worked hard, so you can't really get a bad map these days. But there was issues in the past where you know you'd have, you'd put a certain seed in, and you'd end up with a map that's ninety five percent underwater and stuff, and just silly things like that. But they've got it under control these days. You mentioned in the beginning that you blame most of the time alone, but would you say is this game also a very very good co op experience, or is it maybe a little bit buggy in that sense? Um, so I think PVE, so if we're working, if you and I were starting a game together and we were working together, that's great, you know, in small groups, I think, any, I think it handles small groups better. So say f up to four or five players, um, it, it does that really, really well. And that is a really fun thing. And, uh, you know, that's how I started in the game ultimately. And that is the, you know, probably the best way to enjoy it, playing it with, with your friends. I do it on my own for content sake, really, but I still really enjoy it. But um, there is a player versus player mode, I guess, and there's some servers, but those players feel really hard done by because, you know, they, they have designed it as a single player PvE game, ultimately, and they have put in a mode as an afterthought where it's PvP. Um, but PvP is just really buggy, really, really buggy. Just things where you can kind of like, you know, see through walls and stuff <laughs> because it's a voxel game. It's about, you know, it, there's always going to be issues, so... Yeah, PvP players, I think, maybe feel a bit hard done by, but certainly player versus environment mode, a group of friends, it's, you know, it's probably the most fun way to enjoy it. I also saw, of course, that there are very big community servers, up to 100 players, which you have to rent, basically. How good is the, the server hosting on your own compared to the server hosting from a yeah, server farm, a classical hoster, basically? Um, well, I mean, if you again, if you're playing locally with a, you know, if you're playing with a friend who's in the same country or same continent as you, um, as we are now, uh, you know, that that's fine. Um, but then, if you're talking a big community server, uh, you know, there's, I think there's a place place for them where it's multiple people and people are on at different times of day and stuff. Um, I think it's two different things really. So I think it depends what you want out of the game. If you want a server and a community you can be part of and just jump on and off, then definitely. Um, you know, a server host the best thing for that. But if it's just a, a casual game between friends, then, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing it like this. But the only issue is if you wanted to jump on and finish a project, you wouldn't be able to because um, I'm the host. So, you know, obviously, if I'm not on, you can't be on in this save right now. Well, at least I saw the possibility that you can have a own dedicated server on your machine. So you can have a workaround at least there. You can, you can do that, yeah, that's possible. Which is a unique feature. So many games nowadays don't have that option. Yeah, you don't see, you don't hear of it too much, do you? So, yeah, usually you have to kind of, <laughs> I don't want to use the word hack, but you kind of have to hack around it to kind of be able to play like that sometimes. That, and I also think about the longevity of the game, because we have seen it so many times in the past when the developer the publisher basically says uh we don't care about this game anymore we shut it off yeah it's sometimes hard if it's only their own master servers if the community has a saying in it and they can have basically a dedicated server it's always good the game can survive basically forever yeah that's very true because uh, yeah there's things like um the famous clip of i think halo 3 servers being turned off and people being all emotional and stuff um, so, yeah, and th that's always a sad day for any community. So, I yeah, fully agree with you. Yeah, and it's not necessary because, of course, the, the, the publisher and the developers can't invest forever money into a dead game. That's totally fine. But killing a game totally doesn't make any sense. It's just an insult to the community. Yeah, especially, you know, the, a lot of these games do have very active communities still, don't they? So, yeah, it's always a shame when something like that happens. Then before we basically switch to the other big topic, your YouTube channel, I also would like to know what basically should a new player do the first few hours in game? What should be his goals? Um, so the first thing you do is, uh, well, um, can we, oh, well, yeah, I can talk you through it. So the first thing you do, you spawn him and you're going to want to um, complete your task. You may even still have it in the top right of your screen. Um, where it says gather plant fibers or open challenge menu or something. After a challenge window, yeah. 
Yeah, so you have to basically follow that. And um, so it's things like punch, grass, craft primitive armor, craft a club, you know, uh, craft a bow and arrow, all this sort of thing. So it's just teaching you the game, basically. Um, teaching you some of the core mechanics. So you have to do that. And then it takes you to the trader. It, to any new player, I would just recommend setting up a basic base outside of the trader and then just, you know, just like a wooden platform with some storage boxes on your bedroll, a campfire, and then just go into the trader, doing quests, um, selling what you don't need, uh, getting what you do need from them, and just doing that repeatedly uh, to begin with, just because that'll get you familiar with the game. It'll get you acquainted with the area, the quests, the system, how the game operates, and it'll get you some much needed materials that you'll need to survive. So head beeline it for your trader, which uh, gives you where that is after you've started. Once you've completed that challenge guide, it'll tell you where the trader is. Um, head straight for them and uh, yeah, just work for them basically for the first few days until you kind of understand it a bit more. You mentioned a trader. I find, I'm not sure if it's every trader, but this trader, of course, was a little bit, a little bit bitchy, complained all the time. And, and I find it also a little bit, I, I won't say clunky, the interface, but it could be a little bit better. They, they could give you more on the interface side. They could... Um, if you more stuff to do at the trader side, it's a little bit underdeveloped in my quick interaction with him. What do you say? Well, yeah, I think the UI in general, are you in? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean. So there's a trader on the corner, that's why I'm getting this out. Uh, so just to you know, for the sake of your video, you can show what you're talking about, maybe. Um, this is my YouTuber brain coming on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Out of my way, you. Oh, man. we got problems here. Right. One second. I can I can fix this. Uh, so I need... There's dev okay, so, tools. so we can't go over it with the car. Well, we can, I can pick, just pick the car up. I was going to dig out those blocks, yeah. but we can just do this. There we go. It's locked again. It's locked again. Oh, wow. <laughs> it relocked it. <laughs> uh, this this is a nightmare vehicle for driving downtown. By the way, as you can see, it's uh, it's a nice vehicle um, for storage. Have you seen the size of the storage in this? I wanted to ask how I can see that if even have the if the vehicles have storage. Yes, they do. All of them do. So um, let me just okay, pick this up. Yep. And put this down over here. The collision system Unlock is really a, a tough nut in this game. Yeah, it is. So if you uh, hold down E, go to radial, and then the thing that looks like a mini bag. Open a storage, yeah. They have different levels of storage, all of them. So um, the mini bag, for example, I unlock this for you. If you look in there, that's, this is um, the second vehicle you get in the game. So you can see that's a lot smaller. Yeah. Th th oh, yeah that's they have, they have a big improvement in DayZ, maybe, that you have a real number how many storage slots there are in your inventory in your vehicles that would have been nice here yeah that's i mean this this vehicle here it's the only good thing it's got going for it is it locked again oh yes <laughs> <laughs> uh oh no oh. you're driving all right yeah. you have to unlock it oh, is it no. still locked no 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 sorry my mistake my mistake Right, you're... No, no, right. you drive. I don't. Okay. I don't have an insurance here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so traders just down here. Um, so yeah, there's this is a great vehicle for like moving base because there's so much storage in it. Um, but yeah, beyond that, it's uh, pretty difficult to drive downtown just because the downtown is so cluttered and kind of windy. But um, this is Trader Bob, who lives out in the desert. We oh. hit an all. It's okay. It can't flip. I really thought the driving in the DC mod is very special, but this is different special. <laughs> so this is Trader Bob here. So this is a different compound for you to see. Um, so he's the more specializing in cars, as you can see, mechanic. But yeah, uh, but he's a lot nicer, this guy. Yeah. But the, the Trader Rack is the one that you would be talking about who's very, very... Uh, did you say bitchy? That's probably a good word. Um, he 
yeah, he's uh, really, really crude. And it, if anything, it spurs the player on to go on to the next biome and uh, speak. Each biome um, has a different trader. So Trader Rec, the moody one, is the forest. Uh, trader Jen is the only female one. She's in the burnt forest. We've got Trader Bob here, who's the desert. Trader Hughes in the snow biome. And Trader Joel is in the wasteland. That's good that they have different personalities. But yeah, I still think they could have done a little bit more what you can do here and the interface could be a little bit better but it, it's still in development we're still we are early in the game's history basically we have only the release version here so there's still a lot to go yeah it's, it's, it's only 10 years old isn't it <laughs> but yeah no I, I know what you mean a, a very convenient feature i really miss here is for example in daisy epoch you have the option to sell basically not only what you have in your bag, but also what is in your car, if the car is in the vicinity. Oh, that's cool. So you don't have to go all the way to your car and back. Of, of course, I I know there are people out there who like the immersion, but I like a balance between realism and convenience. So there is a mod, again, it's um, a mod for everything, isn't there? But there's... Um, I love it. I love it when there is mods. So there's a mod for, I can't remember the name of it, but it's one where you can um, basically have like a broadcast storage. So um, it's not for selling to the trader, but you can use it for crafting. So you don't have to go into every chest to pull out every ingredient. If you've got it in your chests, the game knows and you can craft the item without going into your chest. So there's that. that, that, that that's a mod that's out there somewhere. Good, then I would say we move on. To your YouTube channel. When did you decide basically to start it? So, uh, yeah, there's a, a bit of a story here. So I, um, as I said, I got into the game from watching Neebs Gaming. And then I kind of, I kind of enjoyed Neebs Gaming, played the game. But then because Neebs Gaming are very much comedy, um, which is a great art. They're still, you know, one of my favorite YouTube channels. But um, some, I wanted to learn maybe from more serious players as well, more educational um, so I started watching YouTubers and I'd never really, you know, I used to watch GTA uh, fail compilations. That's all I used to watch years ago. But then I discovered Neebs game and discovered this game, then discovered this game's YouTubers. So I started watching like Skippy0330, KH848, um, people, people like that, uh, Games for Kicks. Um, he's a, he's a German fellow who is based in Ireland. So he's got a great accent. He's got a kind of um, Irish German accent, which is brilliant. Um, and yeah, the, watching those guys back in back in kind of 2017, 2018, um, and they were all on PC, and I was playing on console, and they were roughly the same development then. But then this whole drama happened when uh, the, the Telltale Games, who were the console publisher, um, they went out of business. The console couldn't get updated anymore, and the PC version kept getting updated. So I was kind of stuck watching these people carry out a, a hobby that I couldn't do. Um, so my, I wanted to play this game and I couldn't play it because the updates weren't available on console and I wasn't a PC gamer yet. And so I basically bought a game gaming PC just so I could play this game and other games, but you know mainly this game. And then when I got it, because I, I was so into watching YouTubers at this point, that I decided, uh, oh, why don't I just give this a go? And um, of course, like a lot of these stories, it, it, it was lockdown. So I had a bit of extra time and stuff. Probably would never have done it if it wasn't for lockdown. And the first time you sit down and try and do it, it's so awkward. You feel really embarrassed talking into the microphone. Um, you don't even sound like yourself. You, it's uh, it's really strange, but you get used to it. And um, yeah, it's something that I, you know, my main hobby these days. I just really, really, really enjoy the whole process of making making YouTube videos. And how hard was it for you to get into it? You you mentioned, of course, the difficulty in talking to a empty room, basically. But the technical aspect, how hard was this for you? So technically, it's, it's a lot to learn. I mean, the the thing about YouTube is um, everyone wants the shortcut to success. And there is no shortcut to success. Is the thing that you learn as you go along. And you have to make the same mistake that everyone makes because you don't believe it until you've gone through it yourself. Um, so everyone, when they start out, you know, they, they, they kind of want to rush to try and get the most subs and all, all this sort of stuff. But technically, you know, I, I downloaded OBS. I ordered a cheap microphone and I... Just hit record basically with a <laughs> and um you know it was awful you could hear my mouse clicking you could hear my desk vibrating when i was hitting the keys and the keyboard yeah i just i couldn't put a coherent thought together i was trying too hard you know to to try and and then it wasn't being my authentic self because of that 
But that's just something that everybody goes through, I think, because it's so it's such a strange thing. Gaming is usually this kind of private thing that you may maybe just do when you're winding down, and then you're having to do it as a kind of performative art. And it's not something, it's totally different. It's totally inverts what gaming is. And now I'm at the stage where if I try and relax and play a game, I feel like I'm wasting my time if I'm not recording. Yeah, it's a mixed bag there, definitely. I also think, why do I play it without OBS in the background? Why don't I stream this? Why don't I record it for future content? Exactly. And on the setup side, what do you use for software and hardware, basically? Uh, so yeah, I'll give you a bit of a rundown. So I've got... Um relatively recently upgraded the PC. So I previously had a 2060 Super um, with 32 gigs of RAM, um, but it was starting to struggle. So I've now upgraded to a 4080 Super, I think. Um, I think that's where it is. And uh, 32 gigs of RAM again, that's, that does the job. It's, you know handles the game a lot better. And um, in terms of what I use, I use uh, OBS uh, to, to record. I use Premiere Pro and Photoshop to do editing the videos and Photoshop for thumbnails. Thumbnails is the other thing that, you know, it's all this stuff that you have to learn when you're a YouTuber. You pick up all these additional skills. You, you learn how to make thumbnails. You learn how to edit. You learn how to, you know, set up microphones and uh, change RAM in a PC. And it's, uh, you pick up all these additional skills as well as just playing a game. It's, it's, it's a strange thing. That and the many different opinions about everything especially fa thumbnails you should make it clickbaity you should make it uh simple you should make it very complicated ah so many flavors out there well do you know the best advice i ever got about thumbnails and this is this is the best advice i think and it's not my advice it's something that somebody told me i wish i could remember who told me but it's using photoshop or whatever you're using scroll out to so it's the size that it would appear on youtube look at it and think to yourself, can I see that? And would I click on that? And that's the best thing you can probably do. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good tip. I also use it often, especially there's a, a website out there where you basically can upload the picture and see it in all the different sizes. So it's very helpful. What website is that, do you know, off the top of your head? Uh, everybody will see it now, but I will send you the link later. Brilliant, cheers. Also, what you just said is also true for me. At some point, I decided what would I click on? I don't want those ugly base revealing pictures in my thumbnails. I hate those. I never click on those. So why should I do it exactly like that? No, fuck off, basically. <laughs> I do it my way. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's an audience, there's a niche and an audience out there for everybody on YouTube. It's just a case of finding it and finding the way to convey what you want to do to those people. There's like-minded people. There's people that absolutely hate those big face thumbnails. There's people that hate clickbaity ones. There's people that, there's people that love the, um, the old style of YouTube videos where it used to just give you three options, didn't it, uh, of, of a stills from the video and you had to pick one. And there's some people that still do that because uh, they don't want to change. So yeah, it's a, it's it's a, one of those things. There's so many ways you can do it, and there's everyone wants to maybe min max a bit and get the most efficient way to success. The worst thing, I mean, I don't know if anybody <laughs> wanted to start a YouTube channel. It's turning into a bit of a content clinic. But the advice I'd give is don't do sub for sub early on. The worst thing you can absolutely do because all that happens is you get people pretending to watch your video, which might look good for sub numbers and comments, but then none of them are watching your video. Um, everyone's in it for their own self-interest and you're not building a community and the watch time will be terrible and because the watch time is terrible that won't get pushed out and recommended to real people who would really enjoy your content so you have to be patient you have to play the long game and you have to slowly build up your channel and your community over a number of years while you're polishing your skills so if you did get big straight away you wouldn't know what to do anyway so the best thing you can do is grow slowly and organically that and on top of that of course we are both not giant YouTubers, so we are not the experts here. But in my personal opinion, I would say also what many people don't do is work together. Yeah. Talk to other YouTubers, um, meet up, have an interview, have a chat, talk about setups, help each other. Definitely. Yeah. And th this is, um, you know, I'll be honest, this is the first time anybody's offered, uh, reached out to me like this. And as soon as I saw your comment, I thought that's really nice. And 
Like, absolutely, why not? Why don't I go ahead and do this? This sounds like fun. So, um, yeah, this type of thing's great. And absolutely, go and speak. If you're a new YouTuber, try and find a community of people to, yeah, to speak to, reach out to, sound um, ideas off of. And if anything, it's like having work colleagues then. It's like uh, you can you can chat about... Because it can be a bit lonely, you, YouTubing sometimes. You know, you kind of just... You record the footage, you edit it, you do the thumbnail, you sit there, you, you wait for the comments or whatever. And you know, having some friends in the in the industry is it's not a bad thing because you know ultimately it's like um, if you worked in a factory and you could talk about oh man did you see um, see what the boss said the other day and it's like having a chat about work and that's a good thing for people I think definitely especially if you consider that most people have this <laughs> kind of problem also that the family doesn't really understand it what you're doing and maybe even looks down on it that you're doing it so having connections and maybe a shoulder to cry can't hurt exactly yeah 100 percent agree and yes sadly the downside in the modern internet age is it's not that easy to get in touch to other content creators often they don't have a uh, an email address, often they only have only Discord or Twitter, then you go onto the, the platforms and you still can't get in touch with them because on Twitter, of course, you have to be on the premium model that you can send them a DM. On Discord, you have the problem that either they are too big that they don't read your message or they block you. They have every, everything set on private so you can't reach them. It's a little bit frustrating. That's why I also decided last year to, yeah, sadly last year, <laughs> I'm still working on it. Uh, I decided to have a website. Nice, that's a good idea. So basically a uh, own place where I archive stuff like what guests did I have, social media contact details, future projects, just a, a kind of personal database, but also a platform for the community and yeah, a, a touching point, basically. And it's not behind any gated content like Discord or Reddit or anything where I have to log in first. Yeah, I mean, I can understand, I think, as well. I mean, if, if, if it's a big YouTuber and they don't want, uh, you know, like, I don't know, people just constantly messaging them, just, uh, I don't know, just play, play a game with them or something, you know? Um, so I can understand why they might. Uh, but then they should always have, like, maybe a business inquiries email, I think. Which I realized I, I didn't have the other day after you messaged me, so I've actually set one up now. <laughs> Another big part in content creation is, of course, the topic of being up to date. How do you get your latest news and maybe game trends in seven days to die? I don't really. I well, I keep up to date, of course, with the new updates and stuff, which um, I, it's just uh, that probably my main person for uh, succinct videos like that would, would be, again, it's probably the third time I mentioned him, is Guns, Nerds and Steel. Um, he does really, really good kind of succinct um, news and updates and stuff for seven days. But in terms of gaming trends and YouTube trends, I kind of just see it through osmosis by just kind of, you know, being on YouTube, really. You know, and you'll, you'll see things like uh, the 100 Days Challenge, for example, um, that, that's popped up a lot in kind of recent years and it's things like i survived 100 days in minecraft i survived 100 days on insane mode in seven days to die but then um you know that that soon becomes saturated anyway but i think stuff like that i, I saw that and i thought would i do it but then i thought um i just haven't got the time to, <laughs> to sit and edit a, a 100 days worth of content which uh but that that type of video it's um it's still popping off it's still really really popular um, and as well, though, I find um, lately one of the trends, I say lately, it's probably like the last two years, but it's things like longer and longer videos seem to be doing better and better. So I have a second channel, which is about Project Zomboid. So I tried it on this, which is um, super cuts of an entire series. So you record a full series of something. And uh, I did like 30 odd episodes of, of a Project Zomboid run. And then I just you know edited it all together into one 10 hour video. And then I uploaded that, and that has got more vid more views than any uh, one video on that channel. So it's strange because I think people just like having it on in the background when they're cleaning or they're cooking or they're looking after the kids or uh, sleeping. Even some people put it on to sleep, that type of thing. 
Uh, so that's um, things like that. You know, you, you pick up interesting trends just, I think, through seeing it. And I guess that's also the same way for you to get ideas for the next few videos or do you have a, already a big list, a big backlog basically of stuff you want to do? Yeah, I mean, so with seven days, I tend to do um, the kind of, it's not sensible, but what I, it's what I like to do is um, episodic gameplay, let's play. At the moment, I'm doing um, something called the layer cake challenge, which is my own conceit. I've, I've kind of made it up myself, but it's going through each biome every seven days and defending um, against the horde in each biome until you reach the wasteland on day 35. And, you know, so it's a different biome every seven days and it's different scenery and it's kind of a bit of a nomadic run where you have to move. So that's what I'm doing currently. So that's 35 episodes worth of content because it's an episode for each game day. So that's something I had in mind from the start of this this update. So uh, this world we're in now was my first one, which is just my experimental one until they went stable. And then as soon as I went stable, I started that. So I, I usually have an idea in the bank for what I want to do next. A quick sidestep here. Over the time, you I guess you had many different save games, but can you still use the save games in the different versions? Or is there or was there a version basically which broke the save games? Every version you have to start a game basically. So basically the, the point, so um, you can see in the top right, it says, and you should say the same for you, B336. B1.0, B336. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the one before this was B333. So yeah, 1.0 with its different builds, they'll all, the save games will all carry over, that's fine. But going from like Alpha 20 to Alpha 21, it, it, the saves would not be compatible at all because they they change so much every time that it's, uh, it doesn't update version to version. But now we're in 1.0, I'm hopeful that it means, you know, saves. Because there's some people out there that play the same save for 300 days. And, you know, there's people that, you know, have to do these huge building projects and they might want to, you know, build like mega, mega, mega base. And it takes a long time. So sometimes people do want to carry the save over. And so I hope now we're in 1.0, that's something that can happen. Yeah, I wonder now, does the game basically force you to upgrade? Or do you have the decision to stay on the later, uh, the previous version for a little bit longer? You can select the version you play, uh, so you can go back as far as like Alpha Seven or something on the Steam thing. So yeah, you can you can play all the different kind of versions. Ooh, that's nice. Then the next question I would have is, of course, for both your content creation and your playtime in game, what would you say was your biggest challenge and maybe your biggest reward? Um, so content creation, the biggest challenge is it's kind of getting out of your own own way and allowing things to happen because you're always going to compare yourself to other people in a similar position and so you might look across at somebody else who's doing the same sort of content as you maybe started at a similar time and if they're doing you know if they have a video that does well and they get a lot of subscribers you can't help but think oh you know get dejected and maybe think like oh what's the point you know i'm no good at this and um, what can i do to, and maybe start trying to emulate and copy and that's the worst thing you can do. I, that's one thing I had to learn along the way is to stop comparing yourself to other people and just focus on what you're doing. Because, um, you know, I recently hit 5,000 subscribers and that was a huge, huge milestone for me. And I'm really, really delighted. And it feels really like a huge success for me. But, you know, it's it's relatively small in the grand scheme of things. It's it's not a big channel at all. But um, for the fourth time I mentioned him, Guns, Nerds and Seal, he, he started around the same time as me. Um, we, I was actually one of his first subscribers. He's now got about a quarter of a million subscribers. He's one of the biggest um, seven days channels out there. So if you're looking at that, if I had been comparing myself to him throughout the whole journey, I would have given up a long time ago because he was like a once, you know, he's a, he's a very, very rare talent in that he, he's just very, very talented at YouTube. He's, um, he's dialed in and he knows what he's doing and he knows how to, you know, he, he's got the views and he deserves the views because he works harder than you know anyone else I know uh, at this type of thing. And if I'd have been comparing our numbers, I, yeah, I would have been, really really sad because you know he's on what 250,000 or something um whereas I, I stopped comparing things like that a long time ago and to the, so now 5,000 I was delighted when I hit 5,000 it felt like such a such a huge thing you know so definitely focusing in on your own journey your own channel your own milestones your own achievements and don't get distracted by what other people are doing and, and what speed they're going because it's the worst thing you can do um so that's, that's content creation in terms of the game, um, when you make a channel that focuses on one game, 
the real challenge can be burnout. And it's uh, everyone gets burnt out in a game occasionally. Uh, it's, it's just going to happen. And you know, I've been playing this game since 2017, pretty much non-stop. And there's been times where I've just wanted to not play it. But I'm really stubborn, really, really stubborn. And I thought, well, I started this channel. You know, I said it's uh, focusing on seven days, so that's what I'll do. And I've kind of forced my way through it. And yeah, I treated it almost like a job in those moments where I've gone, you know, if I was going to work and I didn't want to go to work, I'd still go to work. So come on, let's record this video. And, you know, generally I'd, I'd end up having fun and uh, you get over that hump, but definitely burnout. I have a couple of times where I've just, you know, really burnt out on the game. But, you know, I got over it. So that's, but that's the biggest challenge, I'd say. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's sometimes hard to motivate you, especially if <laughs> you're having a very hot summer like we had here. Yeah. So definitely. <laughs> yeah, there are many different challenges and everybody of course faces them differently. Yeah. It's quite an achievement that you reach already five thousands. I read many years already ago that only a few percent even have one thousand subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. M most people um give up when it's not what kind of instant gratification, I think. Where I think the reason I stick at it is because I told myself before I started, you know, it might be five years before I get 100 subscribers. Uh, I, I told myself it's going to be the longest, hardest journey and that nobody, you know, it's, it's going to be literal years before anybody's even watching. So I allowed, you know, I just really wanted to, I was fascinated by, by YouTube at that point. So I just um, really enjoyed the process of learning about it and, and, and all of that. And then I think because, it, you know, I mean, it's been four years and 5,000 subscribers. That's slow progress probably for a lot of people. But I think if I'd have been aiming for a certain, you know, if I thought, oh, you know, I, I really want 1,000 subscribers and I want it as soon as possible, I think maybe I would have uh, I, I would have quit a long time ago because, you know, it's, it is slow going in those early days. It's going to take time to reach your audience and it's going to take time to hone your craft and get good at what you're doing. You're not going to be great at it straight away for the most part. And also being on the subject of challenges, what would you say is the least favorite part in the content creation? Least favorite part of content creation. So, I mean, there's just different different answer on different days, I suppose. So some days I really don't want to edit, you know, and so, so the last thing I want to do is sit there listening to myself playing a game that I've already played and uh, <laughs> sit there editing. Every day I quite enjoy the editing, but, um, you know, that, that can feel a bit, a bit grindy and stuff sometimes. I've been lucky for the most part with people who come to my channel. I, you know, haven't had many trolls at all, and if I, if I have, I've just kind of blocked them straight away. Anyway, I've got time for that. But yeah, probably just like you know, it is just um, the loneliness sometimes. You know, it is quite a lonely thing to do. You don't have a community of people generally that you can kind of reach out to and talk. And if you do, um, try and go seek something like that. A lot of them are just kind of sub for subbers who are only have their own self interest at heart. Um, they're not really interested in making a connection and building a real community. So I, I think, you know, a, a lot of that, and there's a lot of kind of, maybe I'm cynical because I'm getting old, but that's just kind of my take on it, I think. Then I really have to ask, because it's my biggest enemy in the whole content creation, how do you enjoy working on audio? So it's, it's a challenge um, from, you know, it's still not, exactly where I want it to be, but it's, it's better than it used to be. Um, I, I, I'll tell you what I did is I, the first thing I ever bought with money I made from YouTube. So I don't make much money from YouTube. I'm sure, you know, uh, as a fellow kind of small channel, you can attest it's pennies, isn't it, that you get? It's not much. It is. <laughs> but uh, uh, what I did is I let that kind of just build up in a, uh, separately. So I saved it. Everything I made from YouTube I saved. And then I bought um, an audio interface. It's uh, a Rode, it's, it's a Rodecaster, Pro 2, sorry, I just had to look at look at the name on it. Um, and it's an audio interface where you, uh, you, you know, it's just like a USB audio interface where you kind of have it there and you can mess around with the kind of... It looks amazing. I have it on my list, yeah. Yeah, that it's, it's really good. It is really good. So I got that. I got the um, I got the Rode mic. I can't remember what it's called um, off the top of my head, but I, I also got that. And that just, you know, that upped my audio a lot. Uh, before that, I was going to something else i can't even remember what it was on before but it, it was never exactly where i wanted but audio if you're serious about youtube and you want to get into it this is you know obviously aimed at anybody who's out there who, who might want to start a channel or something if um if they're serious ab about it and i'd say don't go out and buy all the expensive equipment straight away give make maybe make get to 50 videos 
and just make sure it's something um, that you want to do and you think you can see yourself doing as a hobby for a long time. And then if you think it's going to be worth pursuing, audio is one of the things that makes people click off a video straight away if it's bad. So if somebody clicks on a video and all they hear is like, oh, welcome to Black Ops, and it sounds like that, then quite often they just go, oh, I can't be doing with that. They, they kind of, they've come to expect decent quality audio in, in their videos. And so if you're at a point where you know it's something that you're going to be doing, audio would be one of the first things I'd focus on upgrading. I definitely can agree on that, but also I would say it's also part of the journey. I had always a good microphone, but it was always a progress to getting better. For example, I had a good headset microphone, then I had a very good USB microphone, and now I'm also on a Rode XLR microphone, much better than everything before. So it's a progression also there. Yeah, and that's... that's that's the best thing to do. It's just yeah, it's, you, you, you can you can look at all these kind of YouTube advice videos, all this sort of stuff. You can listen to us two talk about it. Um, but the best thing you can probably do is just go out and try and do it yourself and learn from your mistakes. It's the best way to improve. And after you bought everything, you still have to learn and set everything in the different softwares. It's the, the programs are getting better in the sense we have AI which helps us, especially. Um, Noise remover is very good nowadays, and um, how is it called? Kind of normalization, AI based is also better, but there's so much more to audio than just plugging in a microphone. It's a science, and I also say it's also a little bit of voodoo. I'm sometimes not exactly sure why I get a certain outcome. It's, yeah, sometimes it happens. Yeah, exactly. And it's trial and error and um, sometimes it's frustrating. It really is, you know, when you're trying to do something and things just don't work. Like I was trying to hook up the PS5 to play a console version of the Seven Days and I couldn't get my Rode caster to pick up the uh, the game audio. Um, it was coming through on OBS, but then it wasn't coming through on my, you know, it was this whole thing and I had to, I had this capture card. And then I had to go to this obscure setting inside Windows to make it listen to the capture card. It's not something I've ever even knew existed, but I had to go and do that. And it was, was not an easy thing. It wasn't something you could just Google and find out straight away because it's such a niche thing that I was trying to, trying to do. There was nothing out there. So I think I, I found it buried away in some kind of Reddit post or something and I managed to find what I needed. But yeah, little things like that you still come across. And uh, yeah, it, it is a challenging aspect to it, but it's something that you, you, you get, you kind of, learn to deal with over time and eventually you'll get your settings all dialed in just the way you like it it'll be perfect you'll be happy and then a windows update will ruin it anyway yes that was why i basically was scared to switch finally to windows 11. yeah i thought mm, what will break next but luckily nothing did well i'm glad to hear that yeah no it's um yeah i don't mind windows 11 really but yeah it's just with the whole windows update thing i just yeah i wish it would stop messing with all my stuff <laughs> Yeah, especially when we hear it during Windows 10. This will be the final Windows version. From now on, we only get updates for the Windows 10 and nothing, no new version. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Until you want some more money. <laughs> uh, speaking about money and maybe goals, what would you say is your your long-term goal for your YouTube channel? Well, um, I mean, I'm... I'm happy right now. I'm at a place where I'm happy with what I'm doing, and you know, I'm just kind of making videos. I've, I've got a boring office day job, which is a, you know, um, this is like kind of a, a bit of escapism and a hobby for me um, that, that I do in, in my spare time. But you know, if I could ever get to the point where I could reduce down to three days a week in my day job part time, and then spend the rest of the time doing content creation and earn a decent wage doing that, that would be my ultimate dream. I'm realistic. I don't think I could ever make it a full-time thing. I don't think I could ever be a big, big YouTuber making, you know, loads of money. And that's not something I aspire to do. It's, I think it's unrealistic to have that as your goal. You know, you've got to enjoy it first and foremost, and I do. And then if you can make a bit of money along the way uh, from a hobby that you enjoy, then that's brilliant. And yeah, if I could ever get to that point where I could afford to go part-time and supplement it with YouTube, that would be brilliant. But if that doesn't happen, I'm still content. It's good to hear that you're grounded, that you don't have the ambition to own a casino and a yard. Well, I, th I think it's another thing that maybe um, what you said earlier about the 1% of people who actually go on to 
make uh, make it over a thousand subscribers is um, I think a lot of people get into YouTube thinking it's going to be fame and fortune. I don't want to be famous. I'd hate to be famous. I, I can't think of anything worse. I want to go to, you know, if I want to go and have a coffee somewhere, um, I don't want to be recognized. That's, that sounds like a nightmare. Um, so yeah, I don't want to be famous, but I think getting into it for riches and fame, probably not realistic, especially when it's so saturated. But if you get into it as a fun hobby that you might make a few, you know, few uh, euros from, then, you know, by all means. Exactly. That was also the way I was pointing in my brain, at least, that there is also a middle ground between earning near to nothing and buying a yard. Just living from it, having a good life and a fun job. Yeah, and that, that's, you know, that's possible. And it, it, it's, it's possible to do that with a medium sized channel. You can, you can make a you can make an OK wage from that, you know, and you, there's, there's all sorts of avenues and ways you can do it. You can supplement it with sponsorships, uh, with things like you know, memberships, Patreon. There's all sorts of things you can do if you've got the kind of drive and will and all this sort of stuff. But yeah, it's 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 what success looks like. If success to you is the equivalent of an okay paying job in in reality, then you know, that may be realistic. But if you want mega mega millionaire status, it's probably not realistic. It's very 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 few who'd ever kind of reach that status. I think. Yeah, for that you have to go to OnlyFans and maybe be female. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you may be right. Then basically coming to my last question here, you mentioned the danger of burnout because you're playing this game for so long. What other games do you play to fight this problem? <laughs> it's not a game, it's not a short answer, but uh, so if you look through my channel playlist, you'll see that I tried to play a game called Project Zomboid, which I mentioned earlier, and, along with a few others. And you know, that, that would have been around the time I was experiencing burnout from seven days because I, I just needed something else. Um, I was just kind of, you know, a bit, a bit burnt out on the game. And Zomboid really kind of captured my imagination, spoke to me, and I, I really, really liked it, and I really wanted to play it. But YouTube has this awful thing where if I post Zomboid, it gets recommended to the people who like Seven Days. They go look at that and go, oh, I don't want to watch that. And then because they're not watching that, YouTube then doesn't recommend it to anyone, even people who like Zomboid. And then it'll, furthermore, because the people who like Seven Days didn't watch Zomboid, they would, they would, YouTube then stops recommending seven days to them because it's like, well, you didn't click in this last video. Um, so it's this huge negative thing and it just tanks your whole channel and it just uh, it feels like you're just stuck and tied to one game. And that's that's a challenging thing and it's, it, that's something I found really hard and I got really, really annoyed and I'm quite a stubborn person and I've got quite a strong work ethic. And I'm, <laughs> So what I did is I went, right, well, I'm playing Zomboid. I don't care what you say. I started a second YouTube channel, which uh, is called Mixed. And I'll send you the link through it later if you want to have a look. But it's um, it's just for Project Zomboid, and uh, I focused on that. So I, then I I was doing daily uploads to seven days, and um, I cut down to four, and I started doing three Zomboids on the second channel. And I've had it since January. Uh, first of January I started it, and we're in, what, August now. And I've just passed the 600 subscriber threshold on that. Um, so that kind of says, that proves to me that I was right, that there are people who will watch me playing Zomboid. But it's just YouTube's weird way of working where it wouldn't allow me to play it on my other channel. So now I'm quite content playing two games. It gives me a lot more kind of balance. And then the only other game I really play is um, Football Manager. And that, that is something I will play in my spare time to wind down, which is just a, a football management simulator, which is pretty geeky football stuff. But that's the other game. It's good distraction from this game, I guess. It's nice to have something where you can just relax. Yeah, well, my, um, I don't know if she was trying to sell me something, but uh, my girlfriend told me uh, the other day, she said, um, did you know that there have been 35 divorces filed where the reason for the divorce has been cited as football manager? What? Because <laughs> people get so addicted to it. Okay, I, for me always the management games are more relaxing, but there has to be something in this genre, I guess, <laughs> which is dangerous. It's just... Um, I've been there when I was a much younger man, um, you know, back when I was like in my twenties and whatever, and teens. I've been playing this game since I was fourteen, you know, Football Manager, and it's um, seriously addictive. You get the kind of one more game, one more game, one more game thing, and you know, you you, you will. It'll. It, it, I can understand why it ruins relationships and it ruins uh, work. I'm at a stage now where I can pick it up and put it down. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very much. I can control it. Um, but I can understand how people can get really addicted to it because it's just talk about immersive sandbox. That's 
the equivalent because you can just you can kind of do whatever you want in terms of you know um, starting anywhere in the world. Uh, you can be a top tier manager, you can be a low tier manager. So, but yeah, don't get me talking about football manager because I won't shut up. <laughs> be honest, this problem is in many games. Doesn't matter if it's uh, World of Warcraft where you say one more quest, Civilization one more turn. It's everywhere, and I guess every gamer face this problem at some point <laughs> in their gaming career so yeah i think you're right and i think it's a constant danger here to have a divorce but it's a sign of a good game surely as well eh? it's a, it means the game is designed well yeah there are also many games out there where you say where can i deinstall it immediately <laughs> yeah there's, there's um some, some cash grabs and stuff isn't there oh yes don't get me started there <laughs> especially on the ea part Oh, and ones where um, a YouTuber makes a game look really, really fun, and then you download it and you think, this is garbage. Oh, yes. That's sort of the danger of YouTube. Yeah. I've been there a couple of times. But I would say, we are going a little bit off topic here, so I would say this is the part of the video where I open the mic to you. Is there anything you would like to add? Anything we missed? I don't think so. I'd um, just say thank you very much for reaching out. Uh, you know, it's just really nice to be able to kind of build friendships um, in this space. Uh, it's been really nice kind of just hanging out and chatting about um, two things I love, you know, YouTube and um, Seven Days to Die, two things I really enjoy. So it's been really fun just getting to geek out of you, man. I basically can return the thank you. It's nice to talk to you and, yeah, meet other content creators. It's always good. Nice. Well, well hopefully we get to do it again sometime. I hope so. I hope so. We could do a few projects in the future together. That would be really nice. But for now, I would say that's it for this video. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think about the game and of course play the game. Until next time.